welcome to everyone to uh, the player, the coach, the person. It's webinar five. Um, and firstly, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you for those who've joined us on uh, the, the, pod, uh, the webinars before that. Uh, really appreciate all the support that you've given us. Um, today we are discussing... <laughs> already got Seth Johnson messaging in. in. Um, <laughs> We've, uh, today we're discussing talent, um, how you develop it, how far does it get you, um, and I'm pleased to obviously be joined by a friend who certainly possessed a lot of it, and still does really, when, you, uh, when he turns out for exhibition games and uh, comes out to Dubai. Um, so, welcome Lee Hendry. Welcome mate, hey, can I just clear something called we're not friends, we're just acquaintances, is that alright, yeah? Yeah, that's fine, that's fine, no problem, right, mate. I thought you might say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, good to uh, good to have you on, Henders. And um, I mean, firstly, what how's you how are you um, getting on during lockdown? Yeah, it's, it's well, it's been difficult, hasn't it? I think everyone's sort of going through the same sort of situation. Um, you know, I just think it's the boredom factor, and everyone's sort of we've been quite lucky, if, if I'm honest. Like the, the weather's been really good, so we've sort of had a chance to get out and do a bit of exercise. Some of us. Um, uh, got the kids out and, and kept them active, so it, it's been okay. I mean, the last this last week has been a bit of a grind as weather's not been as great and we've been stuck indoors. And I think everyone's just getting to that sort of situation where they just want to get out and get back to normality, and it's it, it just doesn't seem any closer at the minute. So, um, yeah, it's, it's what I think everyone again is in a situation where we've just got to dig deep and uh and grind through it, really. Yeah, I see, uh, I see you've been doing a bit of running, I see Mickey Gray. On Twitter today, he's um he's been doing a bit. Of, he's, to be fair, his his times are decent, aren't they? I'm telling you, <laughs> Mickey's like. I mean, I've I've looked at some of his time. He's been he's been battering it, hasn't he? Um, he looks uh, he looks fit. He's always he's always fit though. Mickey is. He's got that um he's got that about him, and he's 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 lean and he's always got the uh, he's always he always says he's not in the gym, but I, I know for a fact he he keeps himself in good in good nick, doesn't he? Yeah, he definitely does. Um, not like Seth. But, um, yeah, not like Seth, no. Um, right, I mean, we'll start right at the start. So when you, to begin with, when you, like, when you first started playing football, so when you were, you know, a kid, um, and uh, who, did you, who did you play for around the Birmingham area? Um, well, I mean, I, I sort of travelled around, obviously, with my dad playing football. With, I lived in Halifax for, for a while, uh, so I, I was uh, an old Yorkshire, a Yorkshire lad when I came, came to Birmingham. Um, obviously, dad moving around and, and, and doing his doing his rounds and his, his football. But I uh, I didn't start playing till I got till I come to Birmingham. To be honest, and um, it was it was difficult because you know it was trying to mix in when dad could get me to the football and mom could get me to the football and end up signing for a, a team called Chemsley Wood, who were absolutely rascal. Um, I just got to meet a few mates at school, and they they set up a team and. One of my best pals, his dad was running the show, and it was like, I mean, we had all the kit, we looked the part, but we were getting tanks, tens, elevens, eleven one, twelve two, and I, I was the one that was sort of scoring up, scoring the goals for us, really, um, which was really frustrating as a kid because I used to get proper ripped for it. Um, I mean, we'd get battered that much, but it, it hurt me that much. I'd go and sit after the game by the goalpost and cry my eyes up because I was devastated that we'd lost. And um, But I think that was just my winning mentality, Brian. You know, you know what it's like. And then I moved on to a team called Kingshurst, who were an upgraded version, who were winning a few trophies. Um, and things sort of changed, materialised from there. We had a good side, uh, won cups and leagues. Uh, and that's when I started scoring goals. I was playing up front. I was only really quite small as a as a kid. Yeah. Not that I'm massive now, but um, <laughs> I <laughs> I was uh, I was really quite small and nimble, quite sharp, and I banged quite a lot of goals in. And I started to get like a lot of not a bit of a reputation around Birmingham that you know that I was sort of this next up and coming youngster really, which was uh, was was quite was quite good for me. But I always had my dad try trying to keep me on that even keel. Um, right. So I, it, it, which was which was always which was always hard because I mean I think when you're following someone like your dad who you, you look up to and you know you take a lot of criticism from at times but you know it's all constructive the way he puts it across. Um, you know you always want to try and when you've got 
someone in that, that sort of distance where you want to try and be like it, it's always tried to it's hard to, to, to maintain that um, but I, I did I went on and I kicked on and went to a, a team called Open Star and that's where it was like myself and Darren Byfield as a, a, a strike partner uh, where Darren obviously went and played on as a professional footballer as well and we had a great great combination uh, we both signed at Villa yeah um, what, we, age, what age was that when you was when you was at that club and then when you signed at Villa well we I was at I was actually at Erdington Star when I was about, oh, I think it was about 12. So I'd sort of, a couple of years, I was at Chenvey, then Kingshurst, then went to Erdington Star. And uh, that's where, obviously, I started getting attracted. To, there was a lot of clubs that was a, sort of sniffing around myself and Darren because we were just, we were just tearing the league to, to pieces, uh, you know, district and school. Uh, we, were, we were always on that. That sort of same kill. So it was, um, we attracted a lot of clubs, other likes of Man United, um, there was Everton, there was um, see Villa, all the Midlands clubs. Um, so I, I actually ended up signing for Birmingham, right. um, which for, a, for one, one season it was, uh, as a, on a school of excellence form. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Which I think I, I kind of get, I kind of get branded for for being a Blues fan because obviously Dad played for Birmingham and um, actually I did sign for Birmingham but it was um, it wasn't really known to Villa that you know they didn't really want to take me on board until um, I had one season as a uh, school of excellence and Big Ron was manager at the time at Villa and he called my dad up and says you know we want to get your lad signed up we want to get him we want to get him down here we want to get him on our books uh, yeah. we see him as a massive future and um, I just, I was a Villa fan, so <laughs> it, yeah. it made perfect sense for me to uh, to make the move across across the city, which was uh, a dream come true, really. From no disrespect to Birmingham, it was a, a you know there was no comparison at the time. Um, yeah. You know, Villa isn't now, but yeah. um, you know, <laughs> it's uh, it was it was a big move for me at the time. Yeah, um, and you so you went there as a schoolboy, signed schoolboy forms there. Yeah, so I signed schoolboy forms, uh, two year, two year sort of deal, um, which was, um, and I thought that was, you know, I was heading in the right direction come that sort of time. Um, and it was, uh, it, I've, got, I've got quite a funny story. But, you know, I, mean, I sort of kind of got my sort of head in the clouds a little bit where I felt that, you know, I was, I'd almost made it, um, which was, you know, I think every boy, when you get to, to a club and then you're handed a load of football kits and tracksuits and boots and you think, Phew, this is this is me, I'm, I've made the big time and it's, yeah. it's not. And that's that's where my dad come into being such a, a great mentor for me and, and pushed me in the right ways because he kept me grounded so well. I remember playing in one of the games and the camera watched me, he said to me, uh, I, I got in the car after giving it the big end and all my club and my uncle was sat next to him and he went, how do you think you did? And I went, I thought I did all right, to be fair. Yeah. And he went, how do you think you did, Greg? And he went, I thought he was crap. Yeah. And he went, you're dead right. He went, you need to get yourself out of the clouds. He said, because you think you're something you're not now you've signed there. You're strutting around in all that clubber. You think you're the big's knees. He says, he said, you're miles off it. He says, this is the fact that you come to a big club. And I was like, sat in the back, I was, almost resorted to tears because you know I, I I felt that at the time he was being harsh but it was a it was a great learning mentor from from him to say to me well you know what you ain't done nothing yet kid you've got a long way to go yeah uh, you can wear a nice club and all that look the part all the time but when you get on the football pitch you got you've got to perform and I couldn't wait for that next game or that next training session to happen because it, it really did give me a massive kick on effect that you know, I, I needed to have that kick up the backside and I needed reminding Brownie, which sometimes, you know, you do need to resort to. I do it a lot with my kids, you know, I think that I, I they think they're that good. Then I have to sort of use my dad's techniques and, and give them a kick up the backside. But it, it, it learned me well and it, it, gave, it taught me a big lesson. Yeah. And like, so obviously you signed full time at YTS at 16. Um, and you, at, at that time, when you like, obviously we're, we're talking about talent and and you and see Darren Byfield were coming through, and and you were you you never had obviously you never thought that there would be at any stage that you wouldn't get a YTS. Did you get offered pro contract forms at the same time, or how did it work? 
Well, I mean, I never knew to this day, but when, when I actually did make that sort of move across um, and after doing my school board, my, my dad went in and he did all my sort of contracts and stuff like that. And he never told me, but I'd, I'd obviously got guaranteed professional. Um, so I had, to do, I, had to do a, I had to do a season, YTS, um, earning 28 50 a week. Mom got my digs paid. Obviously, well, the villa paid my uh, mom's digs, which was a lot more than what I was getting at the time, to be honest. But um, it was, um, yeah. And then obviously, I'd, I'd, I'd gone through through the whole sort of 12 months and, and I'd, I'd been guaranteed pro. So I didn't know that, but dad just wanted to keep me grounded and, you know, not, not make me think that I'm going in and not doing what I should be doing and, and learning my trade because I think. Back in the days, then when we did the YTSs, it was you know it, it was pretty demanding for us to, to go in, you know, clean the floors, clean the changing rooms, everything. You know what it was like yourself. Um, it, it, it was very hard. So you know to have that sort of carrot dangling, and my dad always said that to me is that you know you go and do well this season, and 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 Big Ron said you've got a chance of getting a professional contract, which you know I did end up I end up going on to be to be. Yeah. And then when he came through that at that time, because Big Ron, he just left, did he? Had he just left the club? Yeah, he had. Uh, Big Ron had left, and I kind of, I kind of wish he hadn't in the, in a way because I think with with Ron, I mean, I, I, I absolutely adored him. Um, I, I say that when you know a manager really, really, you know, thinks a lot of you. It was it was great because I, I say about doing all the jobs and stuff, and it was like some some weeks. Big Ron had come in the changing room and he'd, he'd, he'd call us big time, me and Darren, and he'd say, oh, are you two? And he'd sort of drag us out of the changing room and he'd go, um, what are you doing? You know, you should be cleaning up. And we said, oh, yeah, you know, as you do, you get scared. The manager pulled you in. Right, he went, no, you don't want to be doing that. Take the, take the dogs for a walk around the Bodymore Reef. So me and Daz are walking around the Bodymore Reef with these shih tzus. Um, <laughs> and the lads are scrubbing the floors and that, and we're coming in. You know, mate, it was absolutely, it was a diamond. And I think, you know, he, he used to, I remember Villa getting to uh, the, the, the cup final, um, the Coco cup final. And obviously we were sort of, always get dragged across to training with Big Ron, um, and he thought he was the absolute nuts, and he couldn't move, he'd stand out on the wing, and he kept calling himself <laughs> with Dondo, and, oh, mate, some of the things he'd come out with, um, but he'd take, he'd take me and Darren to join him with the first team, which was what I thought was a, a really good touch, because, you know, there's the likes of Andy Towns and Kevin Richardson, Ian Taylor, lots of big players there, Dwight York, and, you know, it was, it, it was great to have that feel that, you felt that you was part of the football club, and I never, I never forget the Coca-Cola Cup finally took us um, down to London. Stayed in the hotel, me and Darren did, and we got in the coach, you know, coming up the old Wembley way, coming, you know, ready for the final. Well, um, and he, he got us kit on. We went out and warmed up with the lads. It was, I mean, he was an absolute old school gem for me, yeah. uh, and I still speak to him now. He's a, he's a great guy. He really is, and he had his heart in the right place. But he knew when. You know, he had to, to be firm on people. So, I, I mean, he ended up moving on and then um, it was by a little that came in. When, so um, you, you, um, were, you, were you a first year YT? So were you 16 turning 17 when he did that, when you went to the Coca-Cola Cup final? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, was, I was sort of, yes, yeah, so sort of 17. So it was like, um, I mean, it was, mate, it was, it was one of them where, I mean, he, he'd always, he always, I, that's why I always think if Big Ron was manager at the time, he would have possibly forced us gently into that sort of that squad of players because right. he, he, he kind of had a big. He'd always talk about us quite a lot. He'd always bring. It, 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 what was what was great about Ron was is that because he brought us over to train with the first team at times, that we we'd have games on a Saturday as you do, you know, in the academy these days it is. Uh, but we'd obviously play in the youth team. Yeah. And the lads are training sort of of the morning, say if it was a, a Sunday game or a, a midweek game, and the lads have come over. All the lads, Kevin Richardson, Turner, they'd all come over and watch. And, right. and big Ron, and big Ronalds used to say, all they used to do is just come over and watch you, really? because they looked they looked how you played, they looked how tenacious you was. They they and it was it was a big compliment because to see the first team was coming over and watching the young lads was I thought was was brilliant, you know, and, and the gaffer there. Um, yeah. I just feel that if he was still there, I probably would have got in the team a little bit quicker. Right, yeah. 
I mean, that's class, that, isn't it? And that's, that's what you say. I mean, I know some clubs have, some clubs have it where, obviously, it's the first team isn't great with it, with the, um, the young pros and the white and scholars these days, but some don't, do they? And I think that's a huge mistake when, you know, I know Liverpool yeah. now are changing it where they're bringing, obviously, Melwood into the, the academy. They're from one site, and I think that's certainly you can't be so disconnected because things like that as a young player are so important, aren't they? Well, well, the, the thing is, Granny, that I, I mean, I don't like to, to go back to the old ways because there's, there's lots of positives that we can take forward going forward with the, the academies and the way they split things up. But it was just the fact of, of, of being around a, a changing room and, and being around, you know, these players that you look up to and where you want to go to, to, to actually be and play alongside and, and put yeah. yourself in that change room. I mean, we had to knock the doors to go in the change room to get the boots and... You know, things like that, there's something that you go home and you think about as a, as a youngster. Well, I did anyway, because I always thought I'd love to be sitting in that changing room with Dean Saunders, Dalian Atkinson and, and yeah. all them sort of characters. And, and they, they, it was great. It was a great feeling. Whereas these days, it's, it, it's different. You know, it is separated with the academies and the first teams. Certain reasons why, you know, that it, it, it works. But I just think it's important at times that, they do have that sort of base where they can look up and go, I want to be there. I want to be doing what they, they do. But this is just a whole change in, in football and, and the way they do things. And I did like the old style, but I was brought up through that way. So I would say that, you know, if I played these days and went through the, the academy system, I, I'd probably say I'd, I'd prefer it. But, you know, they do get wrapped in cotton wool at, at times, I feel. Uh, and I think sometimes you need reminding, you need, to be grounded of where you actually want it, what you want to achieve yourself because it's easy being comfortable and, and, and being around all the lads but when you know you've got to step up and be in front of players who have made it internationals and then step out onto that, that football field in front of so many thousand it's, it's, a, it's a big benchmark Yeah, no, I mean that's, we'll, we'll come, come back to that but just keep going um, with your Villa career so do we go in and like Brian Little's then the manager isn't he and um, you, I mean, you're going into a very talented squad, aren't you? And um, a squad who's doing doing well as well. You in within the top six, and how was that? Yeah, but, I mean, it, it was it was really good. I I, I love Brian Brian to, to bits. I really do. Um, you know, he gave me my debut, um, which was it, it was difficult again because I mean, you know, we're talking that there was only three subs, and you had to have a, more or less have a goalkeeper on that on the bench there. So you're talking two selections there. Um, and to break through them days was, I feel, was quite difficult. You know, 18 years of age, there was lots of sort of hype around the football club about how well I've been doing in the reserves and goals I've been scoring. And obviously, I was getting in sort of the England set up, which was, you know, sort of the 1821s. Um, so, you know, there was, there was a big onus on Brian. And I, I, I had a conversation with him when we played golf, and he said, the difference with Brian now to how he was was very secluded and you couldn't really get near him and have a conversation because he was he was under pressure. He wanted to do well. He, you know, as a manager, you, you do, I don't know what they actually go through, but there's, there's a big, big pressure that lies on shoulders and, you know, you've got to make the right decisions because it comes back and bites you on the backside. But Brian always says to me, he, he kind of wishes he'd, he'd have pushed me and he said, but he had that much pressure on himself that the club were up as you stated, in the top six, that they were pushing to try and, you know, get into Europe, to finish as high up in the league as they possibly can. It was a talented squad. Um, so to, to get my debut, which I did, and unfortunately I got sent off on my debut, I came on. <laughs> um, I came on as a sub and, and within five minutes, a yellow card, um, a handball, and then within about 10 minutes later, I'd, I'd hacked down Rufus Brevitt, um, another yellow card, which was like at Loftus Road, mate. I actually felt like <laughs> the ground was just going to gobble me up and take me away. Um, I talk about playing in front of thousands and making that benchmark of getting to where you want it, the pinnacle. Um, but to come on and have a red card branded at you, mate, was literally, I felt, my, felt like my career was over. Yeah, well, and what, how did the, like, the senior players and the, um, and the manager, what were they well, like after that? Well, mate, I, I mean, it, it, was, it was so, I mean, Ray Wilkins was, was player manager for QPR at the time. Right. And, mate, I, I'll, never, I'll never, ever forget it in my life. It's something that I've just, 
I've, I've walked down that tunnel to go to the chamber and no one's coming with me. The kit man's walked down to open the door and he didn't give a toss about me, to be honest. He just wanted to get my kit off. So um, I've gone in and I've sat down and, and the door's come open and Ray Wilkins has walked. The game's obviously still going. Ray Wilkins has come in and sat next to me right. and put his arm around me. Mate, I couldn't... I was, in, I was on the verge of crying because I'm, I've just literally feel, feel like I've just ruined my whole career. Yeah. And he's put his arm around me and he said, he said, kid, this is one of the reasons that football can be so hard and you can have highs and lows. He went, you're learning one of them straight away. He went, you've got a massive talent. He went, don't ever let this get in your way. He said, because people are talking about you highly. He said, you've got a great talent. He said, this is just a, a down that you're going to have. He said, but you'll have plenty more ups. And wow. he went, kicking up and walked out. Mate, I actually had to pinch myself because I thought... What a legend, anyway. Yeah. And he sat there, and I'm like, I respect a lot of people in the game. I've watched him play, but to have that was just absolutely brilliant. And and the lads were great as well when they came in. But the gaffer didn't really say much to me, right. which was a was a bit was a bit heartbreaking, really, because yeah. I was 18, uh, made my debut, and obviously that happened. And then I didn't really have much conversation. He didn't pull me in to say, you know, it's okay. He sort of left me out of the squad and stuff like that, which. Was a bit. I, I thought it was a bit damaging on myself. Yeah, yeah. that's a I mean, Ray Wilkins, what a guy. That's that's oh, a brilliant, legend. brilliant story. That what a legend. And then, like obviously, you know, he was, you know, you, again, you've still got to the. You get to the FA Cup final. Do you weren't you weren't involved in that though? Were you? you again, it was yeah. Tough. Well, yeah, yeah. I was I was involved in it? Oh, I, in um, the first sub. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. So I, um, I mean, we we got to the FA. Cup. I mean, it was a terrible final. Um, I um uh, I mean I remember I remember um, the semi final more so because I've been struggling with I've done my ankle and I've been out for a couple of months and this is under John Gregory isn't it Sorry this yeah this was John Gregory took over so and, and he did a fantastic job when he came in because he brought all the the young lads in myself Gareth Barry J Lloyd Samuel uh, we all started to get a feel for it we played in Europe he didn't because John had worked with us in the reserves previously he knew what sort of talent he had that could go in and, and do that. And he just didn't care. Came in, put his own philosophy on it, wanted to put his own spin and it worked so well for him. And the fans loved it because he, like I said, you know, Gareth was only 16, 17 and he's making his debut. You know, he didn't, he didn't care. He, if he was good enough, he was playing and that's how he thought about things. But to get to the final under John was, um, was, 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 was pretty good. But the semi-final, I remember being really close to, to being, and I remember the gaffer saying, are you fit? And I went, yeah, I'm fit. And I knew I was nowhere near fit. I said, yeah. Jim, you're going to have to strap my ankle up. I said, because I just want to be a part of this. We're playing at Wem we played at Wembley mm -hmm. uh, in the semi-final against Bolton. And the gaffer went, oh, I'm going to put you on the bench. I said, yeah, fine. He would just be ready. You know, I'll need you. I need that little bit of spark. And we got absolutely battered. We ended up going to penalties. And it, extra time. He's gone last, like last minute. Hendo, get your gear off, and I was like, "What? Yeah. Get, get your gear off? You're taking a penalty." And I went, oh, "What?" I was like, <laughs> packed out Wembley, live on ITV. I'm like, "Oh my word!" So I'm whipping my gear off. I've literally got on, and the whistle's gone. Not touched the, the football. My bum was twitching, mate. Trust me, <laughs> it was twitching. I was second penalty taker, and it was like I, I can't, I can't describe because it was the first time I've ever been in a penalty, a penalty shootout sort of situation and we was all obviously together on the halfway line and it was my turn they'd scored and I was like mate that walk from from the centre spot to the penalty spot and just looking around and seeing the atmosphere yeah I felt like I've, I'm scoring this I don't care I'm going to hit it as hard as I can and I just remember my dad saying I've obviously I've took penalties before but I remember my dad saying if in doubt just hit it as hard as you can in the far corner and oh. I smashed it mate and the Ascalina just got a little put his hand thing. Didn't he? I burnt his fingers, didn't I? Just because I put that with <laughs> pace. The relief, mate. I felt like I'd scored like a World Cup winning goal. It was like, yeah, well, it, I mean, it was it was a special goal anyway. But yeah. um, we ended up getting to the final, which was poor, and I was I was still struggling with the ankle. And yeah. I mean, I think I'm, I don't know if I come on for a little spell, but it, it was it was terrible, and it, obviously we didn't win, which was was even worse. Yeah. And I mean, John Gregory's just been out in India, isn't he? He's, do you keep in contact yeah. with him at all? Yeah, yeah, I do. I do. He's a great guy, uh, JG. He's, he's um, I mean, not not everyone likes him because he's he's very uh, he's very out there. He's one of the lads. He's 
I mean, a lot of the lads used to say through his chocolate, he'd eat himself um, because he was, you know, he liked to have the old slick back hair, he'd tie boots up around his ankles, and he was, but he, he, he was great, honestly. I mean, when he joined in, he was, he was absolutely top draw, um, which he did join in quite a lot because he, he knew he was, he was top draw, but um, I, I got on really well with him and I still do now. I still keep in contact with him and, you know, it's great to see that he's, he's gone on and, and done more things in, in, in his managerial career because uh, I know he'd done fantastic out in India. Um, but he's, he was such a good guy for a lot of the young lads, especially because we were sort of in the balance of whether he was gonna, we were going to go and have that career and, and push on. But sometimes it needs a manager just to come in and say, you know what, I'm changing things around. Yeah. Uh, decent. And then you had Graham Taylor, but for not, not long, did you? No. Well, I had a host of managers, you know, there was like David O'Leary was good. Yeah. Um, and then obviously Graham Taylor came back in from, obviously he'd managed the club previously. Um, I mean, I, did, I didn't really get on with, with Graham, if I'm being honest. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I don't know why he, he was, he, he was very sort of critical of me. And, and I think, Listen, I'm my own worst enemy, and I'm, I'm probably myself to blame because I was a bit of a jack the ladder. Did go out, and you know he seemed to find out everything that was going on. Um, if anything, if I was out, he'd have me in the office. He'd be finding me left, right, and centre. Um, and I just couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't get to grips with him. He'd, you know, the big games where I've been, where I'd got my head in the gals, training well. Um, and, and he just wouldn't play me. He, he put me on, and it was disappointing. He left me out of the Birmingham game, which was it, it, it hurt me to be honest. That game did uh, right. because I was fit and I was so gagging to play in that game, um, as you do in, in all in all derbies. But that's a special one. And, and when he left me out, I I was I was I was bitterly disappointed. Um, you know, I remember him leaving me out, and I I scored. I came. He played me the following week. Right. I scored and I, I just felt like running up to him and, and sort of yeah. stating my name to him because he, he just he just wasn't having me. And, and listen, you get managers like that, you really yeah. do. Um, but I, I did struggle under under um, under Graham. Yeah, but what was uh, O'Leary like? Was he you? Um, you had a few years under him, didn't you? Yeah, he was good. I like I like David. He, <laughs> he was he was a character, you know. He again he. he he wasn't really that hands-on. He'd had, he'd had like Steve McGregor would be, be his main source, and and the bear um, was with, with, with yeah, the, the big Roy Atkins. Yeah, so I mean, he, the, them boys were brilliant. They really were, and um, you know, I played a lot of games under David. He, he was good. He was a good. He was good um, sort of players manager if, for me anyway, because I I sort of get on with him. You know, we go we played golf me and Steve and and the gaffer at times, and it was it was good. It was. I had sort of a good good rapport with him, really. So, um, you know, it was just, again, manager that was in and he, he sort of moved on himself. But I enjoyed being under under David. He, you know, it was good. It was really good. Yeah. Um, just put me off there. That's Frenchie in the background snoring. Aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Give me <laughs> a dog biscuit. Um, yeah. You, um, Kevin McDonald, you had, obviously, he's your youth team coach, is he? Yeah, he was. Um, Kev was, Kev was, ah, oh, I mean, it, I, I, I know he's gone through a, a bit of a tough time with, with all the, uh, the sort of the bullying allegations and, and, and whatnot, but I, I, I can't speak highly enough of him. I really can't. Uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, I mean, no shame to say that. I, I, I said when he was going through all that stuff that, you know, if ever he needed anything to, to, to sort of have his back, I, I would have done because I, I don't know whether it was being, me being brought up such in a hard way of the way my dad was and that Scottish mentality which there was him Tony McAndrew was my youth team manager mm. uh, and they bounced off each other they were great guys they were great coaches um, if, you, if you had to be told they'd tell you you know and, and that was the way they were that was the way football was when yeah. we were getting brought through um, you know a lot of people saying that he was, bu he was bullying he was harsh on everyone you know he he, he was he was one of them them coaches that wanted to get the best. If he felt that you was good enough to, yeah. and he felt that you had the right temperament, he would push and push you. And when you were good, he'd compliment you were good. And you know you know that with Kev and, and, and Tony. But Kev was, I, I mean, the lads, I, I sort of broke away from, from, from the reserve. 
himself and um, all the first team lads wanted to train with Kev because his sessions were intense. They were, they were, you know, they were physical. There was everything about it. There was, you know, some training, training sessions, you come off and you feel that you haven't done a lot well. When you come off from uh, a Kev training session, you know all about it and they're enjoyable because, you know, you, you can look back at sessions and sometimes you come off and you think, what, what was that session all about? I, I ain't got a sweat on. Um, but there obviously there is, there's always meanings behind sessions, but, and there's always ways that you that managers want to rest you up and, and, and try and protect you for games. But Kev was was absolutely he was up there for me with, with, with the best coaches I've worked on that. It really was. And I'm I'm really good. And it speaks for itself because you know, Villa did use him as caretaker. <laughs> Well, so and, and just likes his mentality and his way and his belief of, of winning. Yeah, the um those uh I just lost you for a second. I think my internet, but those um obviously when when you were there, the players that you played with and the, um so you, I know that you're, you're mates with you, you know we're all top mates with Gareth Barry and people who like that. Then, but the you know the who were the players to stand out? Real like unbelievable talent. I mean, like I think you like Carbonis and Mersons, yeah. and, you know. With, with, I mean, to think that I, I mean, I, I played for Villa and, and bit, well, I've been at the club a lot longer, but played, you know, made my debut since, from, from 18. I was there for 12 years um, in the Premier League. So I had some players that come in and went and some fantastic, absolute talent. Um, you know, my early days, I wish you to look up and, 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 and you look at how Paul McGrath never used to train and yeah. he'd sit in the conservatory at times and you think, oh, what's going on here? And then he, perform to the highest quality on a Saturday that I've never seen play. Um, but I always used to look out for the more attractive attacking style players. Um, you know, I used to do, I used to do Gary Parker's boots, he used to play in midfield and he was a great ball player. He was superb on the ball. Um, and then you've got the likes of Yorkie who came in, who was, I mean, he was, he was something, something special Yorkie was when he came in. I remember him, uh, him coming in and Going back to Ron, Ron had bought him in and he, he, he put him in the changing room and he bought a dustbin in. And only just bought him in from, from Trinidad and he, he stood him in the bin. I've never seen anything like it. And he's threw the ball at him and he's chested it up and he's just started flicking this ball up. And he's, he's in the bin, he can't move. And he's, he's flicking <laughs> this ball up there. He's catching it on his head, he's rolling it down, kissing it, flick it, mate. I've never seen anything like it. It was literally, I thought, if this guy can go and play and perform the way he has just done in a dustbin, mate, he's got to have something. And when I seen him play, I was like, he was absolutely superb. He, he got better and better as he, as he come on. Obviously, you know, he, he was learning a lot still. He was very, he was quite raw at the time, but he, his skill, mate, was just, I was fortunate to play with him. And I always used to, I was one of them players that if someone played him from wide, I'd like to spin it around the corner because I was always taught playing the front foot, look for your front man. Yeah. And I'd always know that Yorkie, I wouldn't even have to look just to know that it was on sort of a wavelength where there was a connection because I know if it was just a little bit short, Yorkie would get there and make it a, a good ball to So we, we used to practice it in training and he always used to say just watch the goalkeeper just watch him and have that confidence when you're stepping up he said just walk up we used to practice just walking up and he said the goalie will move before you do yeah and we we watch him and then we just roll it in the other corner he was he was brilliant with with, with all the, the young lads as well he was you know he was very grounded and and, and he you know he'd always take us out on a, on a on a weekend but he was such a such a great player and, and the likes of Merce. i yeah. spoke to benny carboni the other day on on um, instagram it was great catching with him and i mean mates they're just some absolute talented players that, that, that villa had over the years Merce was was unbelievable um you know to think that where he'd been and and how he, he <laughs> His career went, you know, he was just, he was, he was immense to play. Big Dion was, was, was another yeah. one who, who came in and just set the club on fire, really. Um, 
but some great lads in the changing room as well. You know, obviously play play with with a lot of lads. Play with, with Gareth Southgate as well. Who absolutely hates hated me. Um, we clashed so bad. It was a yeah. He, he well he he was sort of the model professional in the change room. You've always got a couple of them them lads in there who, who you know just disagree with everything you do. And me and Gate just didn't get on at all. Um, I'd always be smashing him in training and stuff like that. It was we really had a bad sort of situation going on there, and we then never really really got on at all because he just wasn't having the way I was. I was a jack the lad I was at and I'd come in and he'd be, it's, you'd been boozing again and he'd always have them sly digs and I thought, yeah, wait till we get in training, get your shin pads on. So I just have <laughs> to get him back. <laughs> How but, um, no, there was a lot of players. Do you see him these days? Do you like, have you seen him since? And I, I, I haven't bumped into him, obviously. I've, I've seen how well he's done and, you know, Fair play. It doesn't surprise me. I know he went, you know, he went to, to Middlesbrough and, and, and attempted it there to be a manager. But you know, he's got a great set of young lads, and I don't, you know, there's no doubt in this world. That, like I said, he was a model pro, and you could see him being yeah. that sort of guy who would go on to be a manager to go and be the England manager. Manager, possibly, I would never have expected it, but it doesn't surprise me uh, just because his mentality and his way and his beliefs and. Fair play to him, you know. I've got to take my hat off. He's done fantastic, and you know, the past is the past. We, you know, we didn't, you know, we probably didn't get on. But if I've ever seen him, I'd always go up and speak to him and have a conversation about what he's done. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you, what was it like leaving Villa? I mean, obviously, you've been there such a long time as your club, and how did you feel at that point? I mean, you, you were about thirty, was you? Yeah, it was, and it was. Um, Martin O'Neill came in, and he sort of. I mean, he was a nice enough guy and he sort of wanted to get rid of, I class myself as it, but sort of the dead wood and a lot of the older boys, he wanted to bring in new faces, you know, there's a lot of young lads, Milner, Ashley, Ashley Young, um, Steve Gareth was still there, Stillian came in, who was one of his boys and I struggled to get in the team and I just, you know, he had his ways of what he wanted to do and I just said, you know, where do I stand? And he just said, you, you, you're not going to feature. And I, I was actually excited when he came in because I thought I'd be his sort of player, really. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I just wasn't. Um, so he, he was blatantly honest with me. He said that I've got a lot of players coming in the minute the team's doing well. I said, well, can I go out on loan? Mm. And um, I never thought I'd ever do that. And I just wanted to play football, to be honest. And um, I ended up going, I, go, I went to Stoke City, which was, it was absolutely brilliant. I loved it. It was... Um, it was something where I had to try and get my, my, my face back out there and, and you know prove that I was still fit enough to play football. Um, because you're coming at a, a sort of sketchy age there where you're coming towards the back end of your career and you, people start saying, oh, his legs have gone, he can't do this. And you know what it's like. And um, Tony Pulis took me down there. Dad's good pals with him. Um, so they had a big conversation. And there was a couple of clubs where I was going to go and Tony was banging on to my dad. He said, get him down here. We will look after you. We'll get a box for the family. And, <laughs> you know, anyway, I ended up going. He talked to me around and they were, they were struggling. That's why I wasn't going to go there. And I, they, were, I think they were about third, fourth from bottom. And I went there and I did brilliant. Myself, Salif Juf went there. Um, Griffin went there. Uh, there was a few big players like sort of went. They, he said, we're going to have a good go. And Tony was brilliant he put me out on the left he said Griff playing left back he went I don't want you coming over the halfway line which was literally music to my uh, big lugs to be honest um, he's so, solid you know, I didn't, isn't he? Back. <laughs> didn't have to come back do the doggy work Griff was behind me he was like wow he was a beast behind no one get barely get past him and he yeah. just said I want you to get in the I want you to get in the box when it's coming from from wide right from uh, Liam Lawrence um, anything that comes out the back and I want you to put balls in the box for Big Mama and, and um, Ricardo Fuller. So, mate, it worked wonders. I just played out on the left, whipping balls in. I was scoring, I was creating. And the fans just took to me like, you know, yeah. water off a duck back. It was, they were brilliant. They really were. Um, and, and, you know, we gradually moved up the league, which was something that they, you know, they ended up going on the following season um, and got promoted, which was one of my regrets because I went to Sheffield United um, rather than Stoke. It was very close. Um, there was a lot of things that were, were sort of tied in with the contracts, which I just felt that Sheffield at the time had got relegated um, and Brian Robson came in and 
we had the likes of Keith Gillespie, we brought in myself, David Cottrell. There was a lot, of, a lot of players that I felt that they had enough to get back into the prem where I wanted originally. I you know, I wanted to play there, um, so I, I signed for Sheffield, which was bad, bad decision. I wish. No, I could turn the clock back. And mind you, if I do a lot of things, but that was one of the, the, the main regrets for me that I didn't sign for Stoke because, you know, what happens, they go and get promoted to the Premier League where I wanted to be. Yeah. I mean, I do remember when um, when you did sign, well, originally for, for, for Stoke and, I, and, well, when you left Villa and I thought, myself, I thought at the time, like, he's only 30, surely, like, he's, you know, he's a great player. Like, surely someone's going to take him in a premiership. Um but obviously, you know, you enjoyed your time there. So, and you know, obviously, you had a lot of different moves after that. And I won't, you know, won't go through every move or anything. But <laughs> time to <laughs> oh, no, yeah, we're only got an hour. But the um, I mean, is there any, you know, the the moves that you had and any of the the managers, the coaches you worked under afterwards that you, you know, you, you would maybe have thought about? I wish I had him earlier in my career or um, the experience you played out. Is it you played in Malaysia as well, didn't you? Is it Malaysia? Or yeah, yeah, but. but yeah. I mean, it's, um, that, that was a, that was a bit of an eye opener, which was that was the back end of the career, really, where you know there wasn't a lot on offer, and I was just thinking, where could I go to play football? Which it was, you know, it, it was completely different. But yeah, I think looking back to to managers and, and coaches that that I really enjoyed being under, and I mean, Brian Kidd was brilliant at Sheffield United, and I saw what he said Kevin McDonald, but I always loved Peter Taylor. I, I yeah, thought yeah. he was. I mean, I think Seth mentioned him uh, when he was on, a, uh, you know, the team we had in the 21 side. I mean, you can relate it a lot to that, um, that he had some fantastic footballers at the time to, to look after and nurture. But he was, he was brilliant. He was such a good guy as well. Um, you know, he was a, a player's sort of manager that you could go and have a chat with. And he, he wanted to get on a level. He was good. He was really good. I, I enjoyed being around him and he good coach and then I ended up working with him when I went to Bradford just to get fit and it was just completely different right. the whole outcome the, the training the, it was for one we wasn't with, in England territory and we wasn't playing on good surfaces we were training on a park's pitch there was dog crap everywhere there was it was lots of shape work because I was playing at Bradford you know and it was I just didn't enjoy it and I, I, I don't think he enjoyed it himself really and I, I did say to him I said Gaff, I just I'm not enjoying it I'm, I know I'm trying to get fit but I'm, I'm doing a lot of sort of shape work, which I need to get, I need to get my legs going again. Uh, and then I said to him, you know, can we start having a few like eight asides, six asides and that just to get that bit of sharpness. And he, he started bringing it in, but he said the players are just not good enough to do it at the time. And right. the facility were, were, were terrible. It was, it was, it, it was one of them where you come into the back end, you're thinking, oh, I'm not there. Yeah. What, where is he these days? I don't hear, for, uh, you know, well, do you just, I know. I haven't heard from him a long time, to be fair. I, I haven't. It'd be interesting, actually. I'll have a little look and see where he, where he, where he is. And about. I haven't, again, I haven't, I haven't heard, heard of what he, I'm surprised because I, I thought he'd, he'd, you know, he'd actually... I mean, he, he's got to be kicking on a little bit, but I thought he'd still be doing some sort of... He's got to be involved in football somewhere. Oh, yeah, somewhere. You'd, you'd imagine, wouldn't you? Um, yeah. I mean, obviously, the, the discussion is, is around, like, talent and, you know... the. To you coming through at Villa, being you know being very talented and, and from a football family as well, obviously you, with your dad. And I was, I was speaking to Mick Leonard; he's actually messaged on the, the question and answer things about how he calls <laughs> these days. I played with my Halifax Sound back in the day, um, but yeah, it, uh, and you know he was saying that like your, your dad as, as a footballer was a tenacity like that, that tenacity like you, but uh, a bit a different type of player to yourself, and you know. When you said you, you mentioned, obviously you had a quite a disciplined upbringing in terms of how he brought you back down and things like that. In, I mean, you'd arguably well, you've been brought up in that environment as obviously in a footballing family. So you you know you've been kind of not dragged along is not the right word, is it? But it's it's always in your blood, isn't it? Um, and I was looking at something around Joe Cole like um, a couple of days ago around that he it's not from a footballing fa family. So you know just where you think that talent comes from. You had it naturally, did you, is that, you know, from an early age when you were, you know, seven, eight? Yeah, I, I think, I think, you know, you stating the point of, of being in a football family. I think, I think the difference is, is that, you know, when you've got a, a dad who plays football, I think, um, 
you know, you, you want to try and follow your dad's. I think it's a lot of a lot of kids and a lot of, you know a lot of boys are like that. You know, girls now uh, even um, you know a lot of obviously girls are getting into the football scene. So you know they they, they look up to you, look up to your parents and and you always want to you know you want to be that same sort of person and, and and live that high life and 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 be in the limelight and and that's 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 what I did. I always looked up to dad really. I, you know, always respected what he did and uh, and where he'd been and, and and the players he played with and. Um, you know, even John at Middlesbrough, um, you know, going to that football sort of family. We we are a big football family. My, my nan's a massive Blues fan. She used to get to all the games. Bless her, uh, you know. So she had a season ticket for years and years. I mean, she's she's kicking on still now, but she, I think if she could get about, she'd be down there cheering the Blues on. But it was just, we, we were brought up that way in that, that football environment. And, you know, there the probably wasn't the computers around. We didn't have bags of money where we'd, we'd have everything where we could come in and play on the computer and get on Fortnite and all this stuff that the kids are playing on. But, you know, we were out and I was outside. Dad had built me some goals out in the garden. I used to go out and practice, practice all the time, my kick-ups, and he'd set me targets. He'd bring me cones and make sure I was dribbling. And I used to go out there on my own. I used to, I remember I had a, um, a goal that built at the back of the garden, quite a big guy, I'm in and out of the ground, and I'd just, smash it in the guy and I'd run up to the fence and climb up like I was at the whole end, you know, like chewing over to the fans. It was, and my, my mum always, my mum always mentioned stuff like that, you know, I just used to watch her at the back and, you know, it was almost like I was living it as a kid. Um, yeah. And then obviously I'd watched a lot of football with dad. He'd take me everywhere to, to his, to his clubs that he'd, he'd sort of worked with at um, sort of Sunday league football and, you know, I, I, I just had that mentality sort of not drilled in me. I wanted it and it, it just felt nice that I could go along with it. And, you know, and then you look at like the likes of John, obviously at Middlesbrough, and I'd always keep an eye out as a kid of, you know, how he was getting on. He was at Bradford at the times and it was just, I wanted to be that. I wanted to be like dad. I wanted to be like John. Um, and, and it's just, it's materialised for our family. You know, we've got John's lad who's, who was at Man United, Luke, we've got Stephen and, I think we we I think there's the Allens and then there's sort of us that have got that football right. family, which is it's great. Uh, you know, it's great, and it doesn't always work like that. Um, it doesn't always work like that, but I think you know we we all we all had, we've all had to work hard to where we've got to, um, and it's just it's just ironic that we've just ended up being that massive football family. But I think if you've got that background of not just <laughs> my dad, my mom, everyone's everyone's football mad in our family, so. I think we were sort of we were just born to born to be a part of it, really. Yeah, and I mean, you see, you hear it a lot these days where people are saying, "Oh, kids will get burnt out; they're playing too much." And but you know, I think back when you know, growing up, you play all the time, wouldn't you? You wouldn't there wouldn't be in the in the, particularly these days, obviously, where kids start, they can't play out as much. It's it's a bit no, hip, hypocritical, really, isn't it? When you're saying, oh, they're playing too much when they're playing three times a week, training three times a week, because they, they didn't get the opportunity. Well, I, I think so, because... I lost you there, mate. But, yeah, I, 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 think, I think so, because I just feel that... I feel at times is that, you know, I was, I was playing... Well, I mean, the, the, the times have changed, you know, from, from when, when you signed... I mean, I signed at Villa, but I could still play for my school. I could still play for district. I could still play for who I wanted. Sunday League, um, there wasn't them rulings where you couldn't do that, whereas now that's coming to place. And a lot of kids are at academies these days, decent players, where mm -hmm. I used to play game after game. I mean, I played for the districts. And then I, there was a, they ended up doing a little league over the, the school where I, where I lived. And I, I climbed over the fence and I signed for the little league side. I was, I was playing, I must have been playing four, five, six games a week at least. And then that would that, be out, me outside playing out in the front and the back and it's in, you can't get enough for as a as a kid, yeah, I agree you need your rest and you need to recover. But I think as a kid, you should just be allowed to go and enjoy yourself. There shouldn't be that pressure that that's that's mounted on these youngsters. Um but you know, I go back to the times of change dramatically because, you know, some of these lads are just getting signed because they've got a little bit of talent they feel they can work with them which is great it's, it really is but I think sometimes you know you need to you need to go and play in sort of areas where you know you, you, you're coming up against rough and ready kids who are going to give you that little bit of you know mental physical strength where you're going to come up and have a battle because 
you know, you don't you don't always get that when you're in, in the academy sort of style of football because you, you're protected a lot. Um, and that's why I feel I had that sort of mentality that I'd come up against, I was only small, as I said, but I'd come up against big lads and it didn't phase me. I wanted to give them a whack and I wanted to, to show them that I was, I was around. I, they didn't phase me. And, you know, playing as much football, I just think it's, I think it's great for youngsters. It gets them out, it gets them on exercise and it, it, it keeps them off them frigging computers that do my sweeting. Yeah, and how, how are you with your kids in terms of like, yeah, I've, you compare it to how your dad was with you and... Yeah, well, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so much like my dad. And, right. you know, it, it's when you have conversations like this that you, you think a lot of, of how you actually, how the times have changed. And <laughs> I, I listen to a lot of the old boys when I go down to the Villa, the you know, European Cup winning side and, I come in at half time and they're going, wow, oh, he's crap, he's earning this. And and I kind of feel like I'm, I'm going down that sort of slippery road of it. And I'm like, just using that as a, a, a bit of an explanation how I am with, with, with my lads is that because I was brought up that tough way and I, I felt that, you know, I, well, I felt that I, I have to pass that on to, to, to him. And I do at times and I'm, I'm very critical and I'm very firm because I, I, I've been brought up that way um, but do we need to be like that with with these youngsters now the times have changed where let's be honest there's no rash real tackles there's no you, you're protected um, it's really a football based game where you know you're going out it's, it's technical it's, it's about movement it's there's not much tackling and, and physical side really in the game is there um, so you know, maybe I do need to drop down a notch. And I have been thinking about that lately, is that sometimes I am really critical. It's only when I see, you know, Theo playing, especially who's 10, um, and I watch him how good he is, and then I'll come and sneakily watch him, and he's poor because he, he's sort of going through the motions and he thinks he's having a jolly up with his mates. Well, I want him to do that, but I want him to, to go in and be serious. I want him to have that winning mentality. And that's sometimes that really is a big concern with me of... of, of of the way the youngsters are brought up at school, you know, that there's, there's, everyone's a winner. Well, yeah. I don't agree with that no. at all. You know, um, you're a winner. I want to be a winner. Your team wants to win. If you, you lose, you lose. And that's, that's the way it is. There's second place, you get nothing. First yeah. place, you get prizes. Um, and that's the way I, I try to, to sort of mentor him. Um, but I do think he's a bit soft like his mum and, <laughs> you know, maybe if I can put that blend together because he has, he's got good technique and he's, you know, he's neat and tidy on the ball. Um, I think, you know, it might be that I have to maybe change my ways and, and my personality and, and way to him. But, I mean, you, you mentioned obviously the game's changed and, and how it's played and, and what have you, but that, that desire still to, that desire you need to have to be better than the next person, um, it still has to be there, doesn't it? It doesn't matter. Um, how the game changed there. So, do you think that if your dad wasn't as as he was with you, and, and he allowed you to kind of step out of line, be like you just mentioned there with your son, if messing about with his mates, do you think that you would have you would have still made it? Or, um, I've got I've got to say no. I, right. I really have, um, because I feel that. I mean, I'm sitting up, so I'll say something, but I'm, I'm going to say no. I feel that I could have easily been led astray with with with, with things easily, uh, which I, I probably was once I'd, I sort of made the mark and my benchmark because I know it sounds stupid, but when I did get into the first team and I did start having to spend for myself, my dad sort of went out of the, the picture a little bit. Right. Um, and that's where I feel that not that I went downhill, but I just felt that I needed probably that kick up the arse still yeah. at 22, 23, 24, because, you know, you always need reminding, don't you? And, and you can get way, way ahead of yourself. Um, you know, there was no doubt that I did have ability and, and there was no doubt that, you know, that I, I should have gone on it and done what I did, which, you know, I did. But I think without my dad there, I don't think, I don't think I would have, I would have had that, that, I say drive. I wouldn't have had that push that he was sort of pushing me along and reminding me, and 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 you know having that fact that he did play football and I wanted to make him proud, you know. Um, so I I, I I don't know. I mean, I, I probably I would probably say no, but that, that's just my personal view on it. Yeah, 
that's interesting. Is um, so uh, so I reckon then you might be sticking to the to uh, <laughs> being uh, being a little bit like your dad, which I don't think is a bad thing to be honest with you, mate. Yeah. Um, no, I don't. Um, I mean, we've got a few questions here. I mean, we've just realised that it's, it's five, to, five two, so we're nearly up the hour. Not, not. It, does, it doesn't matter. We can still go over it. But um, I mean, it's got a couple of questions uh, from Graham Thorpe, who's from uh, Billingham. Uh, Syn- you're going to have to help me out with this. Sindonia, Sindonia, is that right? Right. <laughs> um, uh, but what advice uh, would you give to young players who've been released by pro clubs? Oh. Um, it's 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 a, such a difficult one that is, um, and I mean, I was fortunate I didn't get released, you know. So it, you know, to put to put that into perspective is that you, you, I mean, you've got to you've got to have that. I, I I always look back on things that give me that extra incentive to go and do well, and I I would always say that to youngsters is that. It's not over if you're being released. The amount of players that you could look back on that have been released from football clubs and gone on to be established footballers in every league division that you can talk about. Some have gone on to be world-class players. Mm. I think for youngsters that, that do get released from clubs, I would always take that as right. This is where I'm, I'm going to improve. This is where I'm going to prove to people that I am good enough because... You can sit there and, and go through the motions as a youngster and you can feel upset. Well, feel upset, but you know what? Just keep that in mind of what you know has, has actually has happened to you and, and what you're going to do to prove that person wrong who's released you because it's not over. Not at a young age. You've got plenty of time to go and prove yourself to other clubs and you've got plenty of time to have that drive and to, to force yourself back into a situation where you're going to be in that situation before you got released because that's what I would always do I'd, I'd, and I'd advise that to youngsters is that if you're good enough believe in yourself it's one person that makes a decision two people maybe that make a decision on whether you're you know going to be in or signing a, a contract or not there's plenty of other clubs that you can go and strive on yes yeah, so it's a good I mean it's a good point when it comes to that that talent side of it because it is um, how people see you um, and you know opportunities you, you, you could get so um, and he's also said, how would um, how would you get the best out of the individual players accessing your men- mentoring services? Is that? Yeah, I think I think getting the best out. Of, like, I mean, you know, I did it, I did my academy stuff uh, not so long back, and yeah. I think I think there's players that I, I always remember a, a young lad coming in, and he he was he was such he, he had sort of a raw talent. Um, and he come from a bad background. He'd had all sorts of things go on with him. He'd been in foster care, and and he he, he had he had a bad attitude. He had a really bad attitude. He felt that the world owed him stuff. And I always we always remember this, and it always sticks with me. Is that I remember saying to him one day, and I just put my arm around him, and I just took him for a walk around the pitch, and it was just before a game. And I says, "You've got you've got a chance of, of going and proving proving yourself, and you've got ability." Um, and he didn't believe in himself. He didn't believe me. He said, no, I haven't. He said, I haven't. I said, you have? I said, you've got a ability. but you've got to believe that you have. I says, I want you to just put all your sort of problems behind you. When you go out on a football pitch, take it out on everyone else on there. Go and show. Go and run around. Go and prove that you've got that, that heart, that you want to do something. Um, and it was just a matter of me putting my arm around him. And I'll never forget, he scored a hat-trick within like 20, 20 minutes. <laughs> and I was... I was I was proud myself that I did it. I, I mean, the coach I was doing it doing it with, with Ryan and Merman. He said, "Oh, he's he's, a, he's hard work. And I said, "Mate, he needs he needs his art. He needs someone to give him that give him that little bit, bit of love and attention." And and I did that. And I, I don't get me wrong, he, he he keep turning up late, and and then all of a sudden he started to click. And it's just a matter of time. You've got to. It's having that sort of. That feel is when someone's a jack the lad. Sometimes you need to give them a little bit of a, a, a rein in and, and, and give them a, a kick up the backside just to let them know that you know you're trying to get the best out of them. But sometimes there's lads that you need to, and, and you, you'll know that yourself is that you might just need to go and put your arm around someone and, and, and give them that bit of belief because it goes a long way. I feel it really does, and that that was just a prime example for me that, that when I was doing the academy stuff and I did do a lot with, with other players I mean I didn't get the, the total outcome that I did from, from, from that young man but it was it was something that I always think about 
you know, is that you have to give that sort of little bit. There's players that need that little bit of attention. Yeah, it's, it's finding out, and it's, it's. I mean, we had the webinar yeah. on Wednesday about, and the best coaches really know the the players, and you know your players inside out, so you know what they, they need. Um, and I was listening, I was listening yeah. to. Um, we had a, a cricket webinar on one of um, the other day. Who worked with the um, Paul? I should know his name too, fair. But um, he's you know worked at the highest level, and it was about resilient resilience. And it was around um, one of the Sri Lankan cricketers who played over a hundred tests or whatever. And and you think that obviously he's a senior player, and you know he would just let him go and get on with it. But he was one who, who wanted a, he wanted to be reassured all the time, wanted to be told that he's, yeah. you know, he's done really well. He's just scored this Test century, but he's, it, that you know it's, it's just around to the best coaches know their players, don't they? I think Brad Brownie, you know, everyone needs reassurance. I don't care whether you're you know a top player or not. Everyone needs that little bit of confidence, injection of confidence to, and an arm round at times just to give you that belief because, you know, you don't always get that and it does go a long way. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting one. Lee Tabio. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've left some of them out. <laughs> what, um, Imagine, mate. Yeah. What did a week in a, in a life look like when you were playing for the Villa? What was that like? Money pennies, Studi Bakers, that type. <laughs> oh, that, you might be talking about the training. What? Or, Oh, I was the only about the train. Oh, yeah. oh, I wanted to talk about the nights out. Yeah, <laughs> Baker's. Um, well, it, I mean, the training, the training schedules were. I mean, it was, it, it, it was like we'd go in and we we did a lot of. I mean, it was a lot of work in the morning. You know, sort of start t- ten thirty till about twelve ish, and sometimes we'd do a bit of fitness stuff in the afternoons and and maybe a few weights and that. Which obviously, looking at these guns, they I didn't really do many to be honest. Um, I always used to mess about doing the weights because I just hated it. Um, it was something that just I just didn't see the point in doing. Right. Um, just for the fact, because I, I just wanted to play with the ball, I wanted to go out and train, and I wanted to. And I always used to say to the the, the um, it, it was Paul Barron actually used to do the weights. I said, "Can I go and train with Kev and, and do some?" Nah, you, you need to get bigger. Look, he's skinny as anything. So um, I had to do this sort of weight sort of program at times in the afternoons which was a ball leg um, but I, I do wish I would have done it to be honest because it makes sense you know you see the strength and conditioning work that guys do these days it goes a long way but um, it you was must, it was pretty routine every every week you must have started doing it though because you started throwing your top off when you scored goals or you know you scored a couple well, of well I did because right. uh, well no, no no if you look at the times and that was that was coming towards like May time so I was just getting right. ready for like, <laughs> Vegas <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've got one from Stuart Gribbin, um, who's a regular. Hello, Stuart. Um, didn't realise you came from a Scottish background. Did the Scottish national setup ever get in touch? Um, and what did your dad say when he got the uh, when you got the England call up? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, the Scottish uh, the Scottish background is. Uh, I mean, it, it's brilliant being a part of the, the, the Scots, but. Um, I did. I did actually get. Uh, Dad did speak to me about um, Scotland being, you know, obviously in touch about me me playing for Scotland. And <laughs> do you know what? I had to sit and watch Scotland Scotland games at times uh, with Dad, <laughs> and he'd sit and make us watch them. <laughs> um, so watching them and 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 actually being bought up watching them at times was was enough for me. I I, I do love the Scots. Uh, don't get me wrong, um, but. There was only one country that I was going to be representing, and and that was that was England, and and it, I was very fortunate that that England came calling around the same sort of time because it could have probably been easy enough for me to go and play for Scotland at the time, and and probably make uh, that one England cap about seven hundred Scotland caps. <laughs> <laughs> Where is that England cap? Can no you wear it. <laughs> Where is it? It's upstairs. Yeah. You need- do you want that cap? Do you want that cap for your front top as well? I've got it on my two. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, uh, oh, Dean Dodd is Robbie Savage on your Xmas oh, list. That's Doddy. <laughs> yeah, Doddy, how are you? Um, uh, just going through them now. Um, <laughs> well, Jason Dodds, how would you handle Jack Grealish? I thought there might be a Jack Grealish one. Um, how would I handle him? Um, well, he does. He does remind me a bit of myself, and I do get labelled with that quite a bit. To be honest, um, he's a, he's a great he's a great talent. He really is. Um, and 
I, I, I protect Jack and I, I, I just feel that because I've been in that situation that's quite similar um, for many reasons, you know, he, he's burst on the scene and he's been absolutely immense for the club. Um, but he's a young lad, he's a young man that's that's been given quite a lot, well, ever, ever such a lot um, at an early age, which it, it all sort of ties in with the same sort of things that I, I had. Um, but to manage him, I mean, listen, you can't manage anyone. It, it, it's a matter of if they want to take the, 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 the sort of identity of, of people telling them what and, and where to go themselves. And, and I, I've spoke to Jack a number. I speak to his dad, actually had a conversation with his dad yesterday. Um, and I do keep in touch with him because, you know, at times these football footballers now are branded into to something extreme. They, you know, they can't, they can't move. There's mobile phones, there's video phones, there's everything that they, they can't do. You know, if they do something, do something right, it's, there's, there's loads of wrongs that they do with it. But I think just managing Jack is just, it's just trying to give him advice. And, and I think there's a hell of a lot of people that have done that. I know JT had a conversation, plenty of conversations with him. Um, and I remember speaking to Steve Bruce when I went in and he said, get a grip of him, get hold of him. And I, I remember speaking to Jack and I, t I still speak to him. Mm -hmm. I do, you know, I, I've always got his back because I feel that he, he's got such a, 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 a I think what, what the word is, he, he carries a big load on him, you know, being at Villa. Um, he's a big player, lots of speculation that he's going to move to a bigger club, mm -hmm. uh, which doesn't surprise me. It really doesn't. And I, I'm, I've got no doubt Jack would love to stay at Villa. I'll tell you that now for a fact, but you've got to think of the bigger picture. Sometimes, you know, you, you want to stay and, and, and be that, that, that footballer who, who, who takes his club as far as he can. But you know yourself, when you play football, you want to win stuff. You've got that winning mentality and it's, it's winning trophies, it's winning leagues. And at the moment, Villa are, are, are miles away from that. They really are. And that's my only... My only thing is that if Jack goes somewhere else, he's going to be in a bigger spotlight. If he goes to somewhere like Man U, Man City, Chelsea, that you know people are always linking him with, um, so he, he's going to need a, a, someone who's really going to get. He needs good people around him that he can trust, that can really give him that guidance. Because and then he's got to take that on himself, and he, he's gradually doing that. I feel like he's he's slowly coming at the other end of it. You know, he, there was lots of stuff where he was at the way, you know, doing all sorts as we do. You know, he's, he's entitled to have his fun, but as I said, you can't do nothing these days without these phones and, and video and, and taking snaps. So it's a difficult one, but I, I've got his back all the way. I have. I just feel that he's, he's a great talent and mm. listen, he's, he, he'll go on to, to, to massive things, I feel. We've got, he'll go and play for his country. But that's one thing that I'll say is that with, with the stuff that he's, he's done wrong, it's maybe jeopardising him getting that England call up, which is, I feel, has got to be around the corner very shortly. Well, especially as you say, you know, having known Gareth Southgate, as you know him, and have how yeah. I know, how I know Stephen, uh, Steve Holland as well. Um, but, yeah. You know, they, they won't tolerate those things. Um, Definitely. Uh, Steve Law, who joins us for everyone, who um, has put most underrated you've played with or against? Um, most underrated? Well, that's a good question, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, that's that's threw me right in the right in the work. I was going to, to, to be fair. I was going, I was going to actually say, and, I, and, and, and I'm sitting here, and I know that he's uh, he's he's one of my pals, really, and, and, and he's one of your pals as well. And I, I always say this about about Seth, and yeah. I know he could be stood watching and or sat watching having a glass of wine, but I've kicked him I mean, out. Of I've kicked I've kicked him out of this though. You've kicked him out. Well, yeah. I mean. I've removed him. I've, <laughs> I've played with some with some players, and 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 Seth was. I've got to say, Seth. There was no surprise that he went on to that to that big move because I always said he was just one of one of the players that always stood out for me. and never got really I say big recognition of how good he actually was, um, and, and I just think that was just the way he, he got about the pitch. He's, he was. He had a sweet left foot. He was. He was literally. I know. I still say this to him today. He would have been a top player yeah. by a, a long stretch. Uh, and I know he, he suffered with injuries. And 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 again, sometimes Seth don't believe in himself at, at times. I know. I know. You know, speaking to him, but 
I always, I always looked at him and I thought, do you know what? Harry is not getting recognition of being bigger and better and playing for England more was just, was beyond me. It really was. Matt Janssen was another player who, who was the yeah. same. Yeah. Um, only because I played with them at the 21s and I played against them. But Seth was, he, mate, he was some player. You, you, you've been around him yourself. He was, he was fit. He had everything, every attribute that you can, you can actually think about. Um, and, like I say, I wouldn't say he was underrated, but he didn't get the recognition that I felt he should have done. And I felt he should have gone on and, and played for England a hell of a lot more. And, you know, like I said, the injuries didn't obviously help him along the way, but he was some player, mate. Yeah, I mean, especially when you talk about playing at the highest level there and um, having that character about it and the, the, the mental side, the psychological side, and it? He's, yeah. he's certainly had, he had that to go along with all the attributes you, you mentioned there. I mean, Shane... Yeah. Matt Yance and him, both of them finished their careers early, didn't they? Yeah, Injury through and... injuries. And, and Matty, was, Matty was an absolute unbelievable player. I, I, yeah. I, remember, I remember playing at the 21s with him and he was at Blackburn and I, I was like, who's this kid? He's absolutely, he was fit, he was sharp, he knew where the goal was. He was. I, I remember speaking to my dad about him actually saying, this kid will come on and, and, and obviously he ended up getting, you know, he had an, a, an axe, he was injured and stuff like that that he struggled with, but great guys as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll send him the video. Um, there's a couple, there's a couple, few questions that I can answer offline. But um, and uh, Mick Lennon's put, can he drink more than his dad? Um, <laughs> uh, I'll try. Uh, Stuart Milne, Milne's, um, he's put Lee. Would you fancy a run out next season for the MK Irish Vets? Do you want me to do <laughs> I'd love to. Yeah. yeah. Get me over there. Where, where is it? It's a. Uh, yeah, it's from Middle Keys, and it's from where, where I'm from. So uh, I'll just you need to make sure, Milne, that uh, that the money's there for you. <laughs> <laughs> the brown envelope. Yeah. Um, right. Okay, mate. Well, we'll wrap it up now. Um, I just want to say, obviously, you know, thanks a lot for for joining us. Really appreciate it. It was just, you know, it's a really good career, mate. obviously. Um, I was watching your goals back this morning. It was uh, it's, it's certainly still <laughs> frightening goals. Um, but yeah, really, really good to speak to you. Um, we've got Wednesday, we've got Rich Walker and Gareth Owens is the lead under 23 and academy director um, at Stoke. And we're talking about um, through the phases because they've both been at the at Stoke and they've worked at foundation development and professional phase. And next week we've got Dean Ashton, um, which will be a good one. Um, and then the on the, the following day, actually on the Sunday, we've got for those who are interested for the... Um, uh, from the sports science bits that we touched on on Wednesday. Um, we've got a really good one there. But it's all on the... Uh, everyone will receive an email about that anyway. And uh, what are you up to now, Henders? What are you, what are you doing for the day? No, I love, mate. I'm going to chill. I've, um, I nearly came on in a fancy dress. I think you're very lucky, mate. Um, <laughs> but, um, I suppose some would say that I look like I've got fancy dress on anyway. No, I'm just going <laughs> to chill a few beers, mate. Lockdown. Yeah. Doors are locked. Uh, I might lock myself in this room. I've told I've told them not that I'm in here for three hours, so <laughs> I've got to break. might drink them. <laughs> Mister Mister Gorey's put. I know you think you're a bit of a chef, Enders. What's the favourite thing you like to cook for the family? <laughs> <laughs> um, what's my, what do I cook? Pot yeah. noodles and proper soups. <laughs> 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 Easy going, mate. Yeah, brilliant. All right, mate. Well, thanks very much, and I'll uh, I'll speak yeah. to you soon. Do that, guys. Take care.